Hi students, welcome back. It's Professor Bridget again. We are now moving on to chapter three. Remember that I'm not lecturing on chapter two, the information about the cell, but you're still responsible for that information. So um, we'll immediately go then into chapter three, which discusses the tissue level of organization. How at the tissue level um, is the human body organized. Now, let me remind you, let's go to the slide here real quick, of the four different tissue types that we find in the body. The first one is epithelial tissue. The second being connective tissue, which we're learning about today. The third being muscle tissue and the fourth being nervous tissue or neural tissue. Chapter three contains all four of these tissues or the information for all four of these tissues but we are not covering epithelial tissue today muscle tissue today or neural tissue today those tissues will get covered but later on in the semester so when you go to chapter three and do your reading and studying at least for this first week you should be focusing just on connective tissue so there are many different ways that um, somebody can study anatomy. Um, here at Mesa College, well, all of the colleges that I teach at, uh, we take what's called a systemic approach, meaning that we um, go or we learn about the human body system by system. So um, the skeletal system, for example, the muscular system, Another way to do it that some instructors do is um, regional anatomy. So regional anatomy might cover all of the structures and systems that exist in the head. So that would mean that um, in that particular unit of study, uh, students will learn about the, the blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels and the skin and the muscles and the bones of the head all at one time. So we don't take that approach, we just go system by system. So um, before we do that, before we start learning about our first system, which will be the skeletal system, we need to understand about the type of tissue that makes up uh, the skeletal system. There's a type of connective tissue called supporting connective tissue, that's bone. So uh, not all skeletal tissue is, um, or not all connective tissue uh, makes up the skeletal system. But it makes sense then that we kind of take a step back from the organ system. We are going to, next week, learn about the skeletal system. So we'd be down here at the organ system level. However, we need to go back here and learn about the tissues that are a component of the skeletal system before we can go back to that system and really understand it. Okay, hope that wasn't too confusing for you. Again, remember, we will get to the other four tissue types, but just um, as they become relevant. This uh, table that you find from your textbook, I think is really great. It puts everything right into one pictorial view for you because we're gonna cover a lot of material for uh, connective tissue and it's really easy to get lost in the details. So one of the things I encourage you to be able to do by the end of this week is from memory, see if you can draw out and organize the connective tissues the way your authors have done it here. So there are three main types, right? So there's connective tissue proper, and that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time um, learning today. There's fluid connective tissue, which we don't spend a whole lot of time on, and then uh, supporting connective tissue. And look, this is what I was talking about. Um, this type of connective tissue, supporting connective tissue, one type of supporting connective tissue is bone. The other would be cartilage. So this is why we cover connective tissue right before getting into the skeletal system, okay? So we're gonna spend a lot of our time here, not as much of our time here, and not too much time um, here, okay? So I really, really, really encourage you to start uh, seeing if you can practice writing this chart out. Because look, where we go to connective tissue proper, there are two subtypes, dense and loose. And within the dense and loose, 
there are three specific types. So look at the loose. There's areolar connective tissue, there's adipose uh, connective tissue, and there's reticular tissue, all of which are types of loose connective tissue. But still underneath that heading of connective tissue proper, there's a subtype called dense connective tissue proper, and there are three um, specific types here, dense regular, dense irregular, and, uh, and elastic. So you see how um, you can really get caught up in the details really quick and not really understand how things are organized. So being able to draw something like this or coming back to this chart often really helps you to keep those details organized. Okay, so in the first uh, lecture, I emphasized the importance of the relationship between structure and function. So with almost every system, what I'll do at the beginning of a lecture is give you some of the basic functions of the tissue or the system and then um, move on to the rest of the material for uh, the topic. Okay, uh, these are just some general functions that all connective tissues have in common, but some of the specific connective tissues will have more specific functions okay and remember one of those three things I always asked you to see if you can uh, remember about a tissue or an organ or a structure remember it's structure we'll just write s for structure f for function and l for location so keep that in mind and I'll, I'll keep reminding you as we start looking at the specific types of connective tissue here in a second I'll give you information regarding its structure its function what it does and where you find it. So just in general, connective tissues um, do a number of things. One, they establish this internal framework for the body. So if you think of the skeletal system, for example, that's your internal framework. That's what gives your body its structure and its rigidity and everything in your body, either directly or indirectly, hangs off of your skeleton. So the bones. Bone is a type of connective tissue. Your bones provide structural framework for your body. In the case of blood and lymph, lymph is very, um, well, not very similar. It's similar to blood in that it's a fluid that travels through vessels. But blood and lymph are connective tissues. And so therefore we can say that connective tissues transport fluid and dissolved materials in that fluid. So let's just say um, in blood, for instance, a dissolved material might be glucose, or it might be oxygen, or it might be CO2. Those are just some examples. Connective tissue protects um, your internal organs. So bones, absolutely think about your skull. Your skull protects uh, your brain. Your ribs protect your lungs and your heart. Um, adipose or fat tissue protects uh, the internal organs of the abdominal pelvic cavity. So think about, touch your stomach right now. There are no bones right there, right? If you touch yourself in that abdominal pelvic region, no bones. So um, there are four layers of muscle, but that's not a connective tissue, but also some fat. And so that fat, um, being a connective tissue, helps to support, or sorry, protect organs. Connective tissues support surround and connect other tissues. So that kind of makes sense, right? Connective tissue connects other tissues. So um, you'll have connective tissue anchoring muscle to bone. So the way in which muscles attach to your bones are through tendons. Tendons are a type of connective tissue. So that's an example. Adipose tissue, for instance, will be one of the types of tissue that hold your skin onto your muscles. So those are just a couple of examples. Connective tissues can store energy. Adipose tissue um, or fat is a fantastic source of energy. So that kind of makes sense there. And then connective tissues also defend the body from microorganisms. So if you were to touch the skin on your arm, for instance, that's not connective tissue. That's a different type of connective tissue. But if you were to peel off that outer layer of skin, you'd find connective tissue just deep to that. In that connective tissue, there are going to be cells like lymphocytes, white blood cells, or macrophages that are going to help protect 
from uh, microorganisms that may make their way through that outer layer of the skin. Think of um, if you cut yourself and it bled a little bit, you know if it bleeds and you've, you, the cut is deep enough to cause some bleeding. And maybe after a few hours or a day or so, it gets really, really, really red and warm. That's an indication that uh, your body's lymphocytes, your body's immune system, is working to um, phagocytize or uh, disassemble or make those microorganisms um, non-harmful to you. And that would be as a result of those um, um, lymphocytes in the connective tissue protecting your body from microorganisms. All right, let's start with the basics. No matter which type of connective tissue we're talking about, all connective tissues have two main components. They're going to have what we call a matrix and cells. The matrix has two subcomponents. There's what we call ground substance, I'll just letter that A, and fibers, B. So if it's easier for you to remember, you can remember that connective tissue, called connective tissues have three things in common. You could remember it like this. Ground substance, fibers, and cells. I'm not super concerned that you um, know that ground substance and fibers are part of the matrix. It's good to know. You should know that. But um, if it makes sense for you guys to just have these three things like uh, organized like that, that's fine with me. But know that the matrix is made up of ground substance and fibers. This is non-living material right? So ground substance would be kind of like the background material. Um, Ground substance can vary in its consistency. So um, let's see, Uh, ground substance can be uh, watery. We'll draw it on a spectrum here, all the way to um, hard like concrete, like bone, somewhere in the middle there might be a ground substance that has consistency of uh, jello and then maybe down here um, consistency of syrup so you get my point there's variation in the consistency of this ground substance and now that's non-living right so um, that's going to have chemicals in it like water and hyaluronic acids and things like that But also within that um, matrix, suspended in the ground substance are fibers. And all of these are going to be proteins. I'll cover those in a minute. But know that the fibers are suspended in that ground substance. I'll give you an analogy here in a second. And then also suspended within that ground substance are going to be the living components, the cells. So it's these cells that are responsible for uh, creating assembling and secreting the fibers, right? The, these fibers, these proteins can't just kind of appear out of nowhere. And the cells are also responsible for making that ground substance. But remember, the fibers in the ground substance are non-living. It's just the cells that are living, okay? So let's look at this um, sort of analogy here. I've been using this for years. I don't know if it's good. I don't know if it helps you, uh, but maybe it does. So we've got... Um, The ground substance, you can kind of think of that, like I said, as background material and sort of like jello. So all the green jello that you see right here, that would be ground substance. You know how if you make jello, you have to make it with hot water first. And when you pour the hot water in, it looks like Kool-Aid, right? It's it looks like water. It's just very, very thin. But as the uh that ground substance or that jello cools its consistency changes a little bit it becomes hard right and that's kind of the way you can think of ground substances is that um, they don't transform from one to the next but they can occur in different consistencies different thicknesses okay so ground substance is going to be made of chemicals like hyaluronin proteoglycans glycoproteins 
And depending on the type of connective tissue, its consistency can be like liquid all the way up to a solid. But I'll let you know more about that in a second. And then suspended in the ground substance, like I mentioned before, these are fibers. These are going to be made of proteins. I'll still go over those proteins in a second here with you. you can, there are going to be various types of proteins. But you'll never find every single type of fiber in one connective tissue. The fibers are going to vary uh, depending on the type of connective tissue. So think about that. Think about that structure-function relationship. Different connective tissues are going to have different um, proteins, different fibers, and hence different structure. So different connective tissues are going to also have the capability to have different functions, right? So um, you can think of the fibers as being uh, like fruit suspended in your jello, right? And the cells too, for that matter. Let's just say, like, I don't know, here's a fiber. Let's just call that a collagen fiber. So you have some collagen fibers in there, and then maybe that banana is a cell. So all those things would be um, suspended in your ground substance. So let's learn about the different types of fibers that are possible, uh, possibly found in connective tissue. Now remember, you won't find every single one of these fibers in one connective tissue. These are the fibers that will vary from connective tissue to connective tissue. So um, I'm going to cover collagen fibers first. These are the strongest fibers. Remember, these are proteins. So um, their protein uh, conformation can change considerably uh, within collagen fibers. There are different types of collagen fibers. You don't need to know that. But in general, they are uh, very thick and rope-like. So kind of think of like a braid, uh, a braided rope or um, somebody's hair braided. Um, they're thick like that. They've got three subunits to them. And that makes them really thick and really strong. And they bend, but they're not elastic or stretchy. So they're not like rubber bands. They do, uh, they do have the ability to bend, like a braided rope could bend, right, and twist. But you wouldn't be able to pull apart that braided rope and then uh, let go and have it bounce back. So that's collagen fibers. These are the most common in the body and, of course, the strongest. Now, let me compare it to number three down here, elastin fibers. Some people will say elastic fibers. That's okay. Uh, you can say that too. They're synonymous terms. So these are, um, these are kind of the opposite of collagen fibers. They're still proteins, but they're much thinner. And they are stretchy and elastic. So kind of like rubber bands. So you can pull on these fibers to a certain extent, and when um, you let go or the pressure is released, they return back to their original length. These fibers, just as an example, uh, decrease in many areas of our body as we age. So the skin is one. So this is one of the reasons why our skin becomes less elastic as we age and becomes a little bit more saggy. Uh, those elastic fibers will be replaced by collagen fibers, so our skin kind of becomes um, stiff. This also happens with some of the fibers on your, um, in your lungs or around your lungs. So um, this is one of the reasons why as we age, we um, have a harder time catching our breath or uh, we have a lesser tolerance to exercise because our, our rib cage just becomes a little bit more um, stiff because those elastic fibers have been replaced by collagen fibers. We'll move back up to the reticular fibers then. So these fibers are um, thin and these are branching. So collagen fibers and elastic fibers don't branch, reticular fibers do. So um, just as an example, I'll draw one uh, reticular fiber. And what they do is they anchor with each other to come together to kind of form this network or this meshwork. So reticular fibers, oops, that's a bad one. Reticular fibers um, are 
often used to create um, a soft tissue framework. So you think of like bones as being like a hard connect, a hard tissue that acts to support your body. Well, let's say in your liver, for example, there are no bones in your liver, but the liver cells there have to have something to um, hang on to, something to anchor to. So these reticular fibers, they branch and create this kind of mesh uh, for um, uh, cells to anchor themselves to. And then lastly, there is a protein in your blood called fibrin. And it's only found in the plasma, the watery component of your blood. And when there's been an injury, so it's normally dissolved, so you wouldn't find these long stringy fibers in your blood. Normally it's dissolved and in a different form. But when you injure yourself, uh, these, um, the fiber in itself starts to collect and create um, structures that help with clotting. So it becomes solid, fibrin becomes solid uh, when there's an injury to stop the bleeding. Okay, before I go over uh, cells found in connective tissue, let's real quickly review the three things that you have to have to be considered connective tissue. So you guys can say it with me. I'll abbreviate ground substance, fibers, and cells. We've gone over ground substance. We just finished covering fibers, and now we're gonna move on to learning about the different types of cells that we find in connective tissue. Remember, those are the three components that we find in all connective tissues. In each connective tissue, the ground substance may vary a little bit. You might have different fibers, and you'll find different cells. It depends on the function of that tissue, okay? I'm really trying to uh, remind you guys of that relationship of, uh, between structure and function. And always kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, so first up are fibroblasts and fibrocytes. Now, depending on which version of the textbook you're using, one author might include fibroblasts. And another author, and I think this is just in the newer editions, just calls all of those cells fibrocytes. You see how these are compound words? And each one of these words has a different suffix. And let me tell you the difference. Blast means immature. So it's a cell that is not um, in its most specialized form. And then site, of course, just means cell. So a fibroblast is just an immature fibrocyte. It's not quite in its adult form. And so your authors may be using these two terms interchangeably, a fibroblast and a fibrocyte, but there are differences. For right now, you can use them interchangeably until uh, we gain a little bit more knowledge, okay? So regardless, if we're talking about a fibroblast or a fibrocyte, these are cells that assemble and secrete the proteins, the fibers, right? So those, those proteins, they can't just appear out of nowhere. Some, the living cell has to assemble them through transcription and translation, right? And then the um, proteins leave the cell and make their way into the ground substance. So... Um, Collagen fibers, particular fibers, elastic fibers, and fibrin all get made through these um, specialized cells called fibrocytes, or you can call them fibroblasts for now. Also in connective tissue, you'll find macrophages. Macrophages, remember, are large cells that kind of act as um, little Roombas, so to speak. You know, the little um, the robot vacuum cleaners. They kind of cruise around in connective tissue, phagocytizing or disassembling um, any microorganisms or cellular debris. So you'll find those in connective tissue. You'll also find lymphocytes. And remember, lymphocytes are white blood cells. You don't need to know which types of lymphocytes you find in connective tissue. There are many. That's something for another course but know that you'll find these immune cells, these white blood cells in connective tissue. And one of the things I haven't mentioned yet 
and I should have mentioned it first, was that we're going to go through all the different cell types you find in connective tissue. But like fibers, you almost never find every single cell type in any one tissue. So what I'm covering here are just the cells that are potentially found in connective tissue. You don't always find all of these cells, okay? At least not all together. I guess in your own time and your spare time, if you want to, you can learn a little bit more about all of them. But um, biology is so cool. The fourth type of cell that you find in connective tissue are adipocytes. Adipo means fat. So essentially fat cells. So these are cells that are going to um, accumulate lipids and therefore um, provide a variety of functions. They're going to uh, uh, carry out insulation. Uh, they're great, lipids are a great source of energy, so they're gonna uh, carry out energy storage. Adipocytes um, will um, carry out support and protection for internal organs, etc. And then another type of cell we find in connective tissue are what we call mesenchymal cells. Let me just go back to our first lecture for a second and remind you, remember that when a sperm fertilizes an egg, you have this single-celled structure called a zygote. And then ultimately, that zygote undergoes uh, mitosis millions and millions of times, become two cells, four cells. So all of these cells that we're learning about here, adipocytes or macrophages, they don't, again, just appear out of nowhere. They have to... Uh, um, be created through cellular differentiation. So as that zygote undergoes mitosis, each one of these cells that created is a little bit, that's created, is a little bit more specific than the single cell it started out as. So at some point, that zygote is no longer just a single cell, it's thousands of cells. And remember when cells come together, they make tissues. The first three tissues that form in a developing embryo are what we call ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And it seems like I'm going off on a tangent, and I'm not. I'm going to make a point here in a second. Ectoderm uh, usually will continue to differentiate and become uh, structures of the nervous system and cells of your outer uh, layers of your skin. Endoderm, see endo means within. Endoderm usually um, differentiates to become the structures that are found deepest in your body, like your GI tract. And then mesoderm, meso means middle. So mesoderm gives rise to, this is the first type of tissue that gives rise to things like muscle tissue and uh, connective tissue. So if we go back, I'll write this little sequence for you. If you're thinking about this in a developmental sequence, mesoderm is a type of tissue. And as it continues to develop, it becomes what we call, oops, I can't spell today. It becomes what we call mesenchyme. So this mesenchyme is just highly differentiated uh, mesoderm. And those mesenchymal cells, they differentiate into almost all connective tissue cells. So you can think of mesenchymal cells as being connective tissue stem cells. These cells are destined to become one of the connective tissue cells. These cells here, mesenchymal cells, will not become nerve cells. They will not become muscle cells. That belongs in, in a different track of development. So mesenchymal cells are like connective tissue stem cells. They have the ability to be told what type of cell to become based on genetic expression and repression. Uh, number six, there are melanocytes. Melanocytes are a special type of cell that have a brown pigment called melanin. Melanocytes you find in your outer skin, and that's what gives us all varying uh, skin colors. 
but your outer skin isn't connective tissue. But you do find some of those um, pigmented cells, those melanocytes in connective tissue. Um, and you see that in the whites of, in of people's eyes as well. The white of your eye is made of connective tissue. And um, some people have uh, darker whites to their eyes, especially individuals of color. Individuals of color in their skin anyways have really active melanocytes. They make a lot of melanin. And so um, in people with really dark skin, they're going to be making a lot of melanin in the um, connective tissue of the eyes too. So sometimes that white appears almost a brownish or um, even a yellowish type of color. So that's where you find those uh, melanocytes. And then lastly, uh, mast cells. Uh, I think I told you about Finn. He's a boxer mastiff mix. If you know about boxers or if you've had a dog who's had a mast cell, these are really common. Uh, I'm sorry, a mast cell tumor. These are really common in boxers, unfortunately, and they can cause um, um, malignant cancers. Anyways, mast cells are essentially immune cells in connective tissue that secrete a number of chemicals, but mainly histamine and heparin. Histamine is a chemical that um, dilates blood vessels. It does a number of things, but it dilates blood vessels to cause uh, blood vessels to be wider, to send more blood to an area per unit time. And um, heparin is, um, many of you guys probably know this, heparin is a anticoagulant. So it prevents blood from coagulating. So when there's been, an, if there's an invader or there's been some sort of injury, mast cells can uh, release histamine and heparin. The histamine will dilate the blood vessels sending more blood to the invader or the site of injury per unit time. And also it will secrete heparin to at least temporarily um, prevent coagulation so that blood and all its nutrients and the oxygen can get to the site of the invader or the injury. Pretty cool. Lots to learn about all these different types of cells. Um, so cool. And these seven cells, remember, are um, possibly found in a connective tissue, but you'll never find every single type of cell in any one connective tissue. Okay, so let's back and let's recap here real quick. We haven't covered any of the types of connective tissue. We've just gone over the basics. We went over the fibers that you find can find in connective tissue, the cells that you can possibly find in connective tissue, and the variations in ground substance. So where we'll go in parts two and three to this lecture is, first, we're going to learn about connective tissue proper and its specific functions, and then look at, underneath a microscope, the different types of connective tissue proper. And then we will do the same for fluid connective tissue, but not in great detail. And at the very end, we'll look at the different types of supporting connective tissues. More specifically, the different types of collagen and then also bone. Okay, stay tuned for part two.